very interesting hearing you uh, talk together. Um, it sounds like a lot of uh, um, thoughts about uh, you know, claustrophobia, being confined, binaryism, uh, sort of being stuck and in patterns and things like that. So um, I'm curious if you think about escape and the, the literature of escape is something that you like to read or that you hate to read. You know, I'm interested in your take on escape literature. I, you know, you mentioned John Carter. I actually used to be a fan of those uh, Mars books. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie because I looked at the trailer and I thought, oh, this is nothing. Like you know what? But, I'm glad you guys are going to have your price of admission here right now. <laughs> Don't go see them. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like definitely don't waste your ten dollars. It's awful. Really? It oh. is truly awful. Because like I'm a sci-fi geek. It's terrible. And there is go sex see, in the uh, books. The books. I mean, you know, for a twelve-year-old, it's lots of sex. Right. Right. The books, but you know, as far as escape, uh, you know, literature. Do you aspire to that, or do you definitely aspire in the opposite direction? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I kind of aspire in the opposite direction, and I, I am very interested in books that features some form, like any kind of really productive prohibition, whether it be like what I, what I mentioned with Remainder, the Tom McCarthy book where the guy can't remember his past, right? Thereby freeing himself from the burden of having to represent it in any way. Um, or, uh, or if it's a setting form of confinement, like um, the, women, the Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe. Um, where uh, basically a guy falls into a sand hole and there's a woman living down there, and that's and then the book goes from there, right? Um, and, and that, to me, as a as a maybe it's because um, when there are too many possibilities, I just get kind of dizzy and confused, and I don't know what to do. And so um, it's more about shutting them down, like shutting down as many possibilities as I can until it pressurizes the situation to the degree that then I have to do, as I was explaining, like get out somehow. So, so it's not like a comic thing, or it's not like a tragic thing. It's, it's a thing to you know, limit and, and sort of like, you know, focus. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I'm sh every writer has to come up with their own gimmicks or their own things. But yeah, I guess for me, I've found it's a lot easier for me to write something if I've just like shut all the doors on myself and I'm just stuck in this one place and there's only one direction to go. Um, otherwise I'll just be like, woo, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's, I mean, it's obviously a very daunting thing to write any kind of book, not just a novel, but, or to just do anything in which there are so many tiny choices that you have to make on an ongoing basis, you know? So anything to render that less daunting I mean, I feel exactly the same way, although we may have approached it a little bit differently, but I welcome any type of constraint, you know? And I think that's why, uh, just, because, just because then you just don't have this nightmarish, infinite plane of possibility extending in front of you every day when you sit yeah. down. You know? I mean, of course, one could argue that as soon as you start a book, there are certain demands that the, the world or the relationship between the characters or, you know, there are certain things you have to sort of rules you have to follow that, that you create or that the book the text itself create. But um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would love to. You know, I'm sure I, I have a feeling that's why Kowabe dropped his protagonist down that sand hole on yeah. the fourth page of that book because he's like, okay, you know, we got the sand, we got the woman, we got the water, we got the sun, we got four things. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. That's, that's very appealing. It is very appealing. I mean, at the other extreme, that you can, you can take the, the literature of the beautiful Woolly Book. Mm -hmm. Everything's written in a mathematical way. Yeah. George Perrick is uh, allowed okay. to use his manual all the way down to two of other people who are under extreme. Harry Matthews, who are under ex extreme extreme. Right, right, which is, right. Which, is, which does create, please. Well, that's their own thing. There's a lot thing. more creativity, suppose, in the writing. I the think so, yeah, sure. And I think any, very many poets, if you speak to them, will. Praise yeah. the you know practice of writing in a very strict form, like a sonnet or something. And actually, I actually read something in the I think it was in the Science Times a few months ago. There had some research had been done that claimed to have been able to quantify the, the, the kind of boost in creativity or in brain function that came among creative people who were working under some kind of constraint. 
I can't. I can no longer remember how on earth someone devised it. But anyway, that was that brainstorming that. piece. It was a brainstorming piece. Yes, it was a brainstorming. Yeah, That's right? what it was. Yeah. And I mean, it was too. talking about how like you think with limitless possibilities that more ideas will be generated, and in fact, it was yeah. shown that brainstorming, which is like anything, like just any idea that comes to you, put it down. And that, in fact, uh, and that for a long time, it was thought that brainstorming was the most effective way to generate useful solutions for things. And then they realized right. that it was actually way more productive if you were like, it's got to be this, 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 got to fit this mold. Right. Although it could be argued that automatic writing, for example, is kind of the ultimate form of constraint because you're not allowed to think consciously about right. what you're writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 How, long, how long did that last in the 20s? Oh, I'm still learning. Yeah. <laughs> I did it just today when I was writing all that sex. Three way and automatic writing. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. God, I shudder to think what would come out of that project. <laughs> um, uh, thoughts, feelings, comments. You, ma'am. Oh, mm -hmm. I was thinking about sort of rivalry plots in general, not that I've like dealing with what's going on, and of course there's always the ambivalence about whether you want to overtake your mentor or master or not, but in this book, especially at least in the early going parts, it seems like she doesn't want to be a better psychic. She doesn't, and I was wondering, is that, I mean, I, not to reduce, but I'm like, is it somehow relevant that the narrator is a, a woman, that the rivalry is female and the tools are female? Yeah. Or not at all? I don't know. Do you mean and, if, if Sorry. Do you, mean if, do you mean if she had been a man, she would be have She'd fewer compunctions like, about taking down the, the mentor? Or just the plot would move differently somehow, that the sort of battles would be different, kind of happen differently, yeah. they would be less passive. Or yeah, I mean, I guess that's why the whole notion of psychic attacks interested me, because it was a way to hurt somebody by not actually taking responsibility for it in a way, right? <laughs> so it was a, it was a way to act in this violent. So a psychic attack for people who don't who have never know. experienced one. <laughs> <that. Yeah. laughs> is I mean, it's essentially you know you want to hurt somebody, someone you want you don't like or you want to take down or you just um, you're bored, <coughs> you're just bored, and uh, and you you essentially make them sick with your mind and um, and. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and and so so yeah, I feel like that's a that's like the middle ground. It's it's almost way slimier. I mean, there's a way that the way guys just like get it on and beat each other up is so much more straightforward and interesting. I mean, I think part of the reason why, <laughs> um, or it's just it's just more. Um, I mean, I, I have this now. I mean, I have two kids, and one's a boy and one's a girl, and the girl is just like psychodrama, you know, just insane. And the boy is just like, I'm pissed off, I'm breaking this thing, and I'm fine now, right? Or like he and his friend have a fight, and they hit each other, and then it's all good. And the girls just like simmer, oh. and, and like undermine each other, and it's just so crazy, you know? And you do almost wish you just want to be like, hit her, just hit her, you know? <laughs> just smack her, and let's move on. Um, so yeah, I guess the psychic attack for me was a way to kind of literalize that, um, yeah, that passivity. It's like aggressive passivity instead of passive aggressiveness, right? I don't know. Um, yeah. That's why it seems so scary and also so... It's never specified in the book that it's a primarily female weapon, but there is no, no. mention of, of, of any male that's psychic true. being involved that's in psychic true. attacks. That is true. Yeah. I don't know that I did that on purpose necessarily, but that is true. So Whenever yeah. I try to tease some kind of Political stance out of being just claim total ignorance. Just, we're in a psychic trance. I was in a psychic trance. I was in a psychic trance. It's true. Um, Which is not a terrible analogy to the process of writing, at least writing a first draft, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I'm telling you, my next book is just going to be like men, sex. <laughs> it is. I, I, yeah, I feel like that's my next, that's the next frontier. And plotless. <laughs> Lawless male sex book. Yeah, yeah, that's what sports it's going What? Sports novel. A sports novel. That right. sounds great. I love sports novels. A sports novel with fucking. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actual. Right. Um, yeah, it's funny. I was a. Uh, I I played rugby when I was in college, and um, and I. Uh, 
and you know, after you play rugby, you have to sing these rugby songs. It's part of the tradition, and you sort of like shout down your opponents afterwards, and you do all these drinking games and stuff. And anyways, I had to do this thing at Happy Endings, that reading series that Amanda Stern runs in, at Joe's Pub, and she makes you do something super embarrassing. You and sang a song. So I sang a rugby song, but it may, and then I had to go back and look at the rugby songs. And my memory of them was like, God, it was so weird because here we were, these women singing these super misogynistic songs to each other, right? Um, what was misogynistic? Can you think of an example? Well, no, here's, that was my memory of it, was that they were these, but in fact, they're so homoerotic. It's like these guys singing these homoerotic songs to each other. Come on, I, I'm not rugby, joking. homoerotic. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Did you play rugby at Overloon? No. <laughs> We had no rugby need team. of rugby. <laughs> just went right around the rugby and took care of business. Yeah. Is that yeah, that's uh, uh, yeah. Wow, sports nuts and sports and all that. I would like to see that. That would be an unexpected career move for you. An all male sports team. I take that as a challenge. See? Constraints thrown at me. Sports. Or this, this young man has challenged you. Yeah, I'll rise to that. I will rise to that challenge. <laughs>